Welcome to this Jungian life. Three good friends and Jungian analysts, Lisa Marciano, Deborah Stewart, and Joseph Lee, invite you to join them for an intimate and honest conversation that brings a psychological perspective to important issues of the day. I'm Lisa Marciano, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Philadelphia. I'm Joseph Lee, and I'm a Jungian analyst in Virginia Beach, Virginia. I'm Deborah Stewart, a Jungian analyst on Cape Cod. Today, we are going to talk about a powerful mythological image, and that is Medusa. Medusa is so powerful that my first grandchild, when she was about three, drew a funny little image of Medusa that I still have. And what amazes me about this is that at age three, somehow, somewhere, she had heard about Medusa with her snakes for hair, and it gripped her enough to make this uh, funny little line drawing. The image of Medusa has um, lots of directions here, lots of implications, lots of meaning, which is why it remains so powerful in in our cultural psyche. There are, of course, political um, ramifications to this in our culture, social mores and norms. There are historical roots to this uh, as uh, cultural shifts took place over hundreds of years. And that, of course, resulted in the changing of, of mythological uh, direction, sweep, and emphasis, because myths arise from the unconscious, from the clash of cultures, to tell us how psyche is moving and where it's, it's moving. And, of course, there are psychological implications. Um, Freud was only too happy to weigh in on. So we have a lot to talk about in this one image of Medusa. It's a complicated story. There are many different versions of it. And, uh, of course, there are many different ways of understanding it, as you said, Deb. And one of the ways that we're going to be looking at it today is considering it symbolically. And when we look at mythology symbolically, one of the ways we can do that is to apply it to an individual psyche. So we might say, well, if this were a psychological story about an individual psyche, what what would that story say? And of course, there are many different answers to that. But we can also use it to kind of diagnose what's going on in a culture and what is happening in a culture to attitudes around important things. And again, uh, thinking about it symbolically. Um, what does it say about the culture? And I hope we'll get to all of this today. Talking about the story, maybe the first order of business could be very, very briefly to get the story straight. And there seem to be a lot of different stories about Medusa um, from ancient times. Of course, the story originates with Medusa uh, having sex with Poseidon in the temple of Athena. And from that, the rest ensues. For Hesiod, this was a consensual union, and it was idyllic, and she was a very beautiful woman. Ovid uh, said that she was uh, so beautiful, uh, she had multiple suitors and was then raped by Poseidon in Athena's temple and punished uh, for that. For Pindar, Medusa's sisters pursued uh, Perseus, tried to exact revenge. Homer uh, portrays her as being accompanied, therefore, by terror and fear. Aeschylus, an ancient Greek playwright, says she's snake-haired and winged, uh, hated by mortals or mortal-hating. My favorite image, actually, of Medusa, and she is portrayed in a lot of different ways, is one of these authors says that she describes her as golden-scaled, us uh, and with with snakes for for hair and winged, and that is an image of uh, a kind of transcendent uh, appeal and power that stuck with me in all these different readings. So, if we're going to get the story straight, 
uh, we really have quite a task uh, right from the beginning. And and just to clarify, Deb, thank you for that quick sweep through <laughs> Medusa's quick. story. But so in, in one of these versions, she starts off as this extremely beautiful woman. In mm. fact, some people say that she kind of challenged Athena herself in beauty. And that's part of the reason that Athena kind of had it out for her. So then, you know, she's she either, you know, she lays with Zeus in Athena's temple, whether that's consensual or rape, depends on or, the story. Or Poseidon. Excuse me, with, with Poseidon. And, and then is she... Um, She's cursed by Athena, and that's where she comes by her ghastly image. Is that right? Yes, and um, also in some versions, that is when her hair is turned into snakes. That At the mm -hmm. beginning, she had such gorgeous hair. That plays into what you're talking about as, was Athena threatened by this beautiful mortal, which is a theme in Greek myth. So what everybody has wondered about I think all down through the centuries is, hey, wait a minute, you know, this wasn't her fault. Why was Medusa the one who was punished? Of the three Gorgon sisters, she was the only one who was mortal, uh, so she really could be uh, cursed, whereas Poseidon, as a fellow Olympian god, no one could do, Athena could not take anything out on him. He had equal power to hers. And that, I think, has been a conundrum and a puzzle, that she was turned into something monstrous. And so that's a big moment in the story. So there's this, uh, there's this rape, and then it results in her becoming something monstrous. Right. Or worse yet, it was consensual. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, the story that many of us know that flows on from here is um, Perseus. Mm-hmm who, uh, for various reasons, is uh, in search of the Gorgon's head. And he is helped by Athena in pursuit of this, and he needs some special equipment to go do this job. But he is able to cut off her head, and uh, from there goes on to uh, save Andromeda. Perseus is gifted um, by uh, some nymphs uh, to whom he's led by Athena with, with everything that Harry Potter had later on in, in life. <laughs> uh, he has a cap of darkness, which makes him invisible. Uh, he has winged sandals. He has uh, weaponry. And a special bag in which to put the And the, the bag is, um, will, will accommodate anything you put in it. So if you want something small in it, it's a small bag. And if it's something larger, it will enlarge to uh, accommodate that, uh, namely the head of Medusa. And of course, uh, it, it's very important. One of the things that he has is the shield that uh, allows him to uh, see the reflection of Medusa. You can't approach Medusa directly because if you look at her, you will be turned to stone. Yes, her gaze kills but is it her looking at you? I think it's you looking at her, which I, which is an interesting and important distinction. It's not something she does to you. It's something that happens to you when you look at her. So he needs this highly polished shield that Athena gives him. So she goes from being the one who has been seen by Poseidon and pursued by Poseidon to the one who must not be seen because... Beholding her will result in your death. So there's this remarkable enantiodromia from one place to the other. So this myth has been important to people, Deb, like you said, kind of throughout history, and your, your granddaughter's little drawing kind of speaks to the fascination that I think this image holds for all of us. And I mean, I remember being fascinated with this image when I was a kid. I think, I, if I recall correctly, I went as Medusa one Halloween, you know, how can you resist all this kind of snaky hair? It's just such a, it's such a fun image. Um, and of course, uh, she shows up a lot in the culture. There's a wonderful version of Medusa in the Percy Jackson series. And of course, her face is the uh, emblem for Versace. So uh, Medusa graces um, Versace merchandise. <laughs> uh, there are some very famous paintings of Medusa that we all have seen. 
Caravaggio's being one of the most compelling, but there are many others. And, uh, you know, and now I think she often um, makes appearances in modern day video games that have mythological elements. So we all feel really compelled by this image and and this story. And, and so I think one of the things that we're curious about is why? <laughs> why does this image grip us so much? I think of many of the Greco-Roman deities that Medusa really bridges two worlds because she is part human and part this reptilian creature. There's snakes coming out of her head. In the progression of the images of the divine, there's been a movement from the gods being perceived as animals, the gods being perceived as blends of animals and humans, and then finally to the Olympians that look human but don't behave that way, and then finally to the arc of God as human in the story of Jesus. So there's a compelling movement from the Olympians, who are these perfected humanoid forms, to this ancient kind of blend of animal and human. So I would think that in the culture itself, there's a compelling echo back to a far more ancient layer in the psyche and mm-hmm. in the ritual worship that Western mind can feel. And because she still retains some of her human features, she acts, I think, as a bridge between those worlds. Yes, there's something really archaic about this image. And if you look at the history of the myth, it does seem, you know, when you're trying to find its origins, it's very, very old. There's also a historical uh, deep uh, root here in, in the clash of two cultures, the Minoan culture on Crete and uh, the Mycenaean uh, branch of, of that or related to it in what we now call Greece, that was an agrarian culture that, that had female priests and their images of, of um, you know, bare-breasted women, a uh, famous one where she's holding a snake in both hands. Uh, the temple at Knossos was uh, excavated. Um, some of the mosaics are still, are still there. But um, it, great evidence of uh, feminine power in uh, rulership and in uh, religious practice and, and all of that. And that then um, came down a, a huge invasion over centuries and centuries of an Indo-European people or peoples. And uh, these two cultures engaged and did all the things that always happen. They clashed, they intermarried, they interacted in all kinds of ways. But because this was a nomadic people, they had more of a sky god, spirit god, masculine-oriented uh, kind of view, whereas uh, the earlier culture had been a city culture, city cultures and farmers and agrarian and more settled. And so uh, earth mother and, and feminine were more prominent in those kinds of settled cultures than they were in the nomadic culture. So the mythology was shifting from a more, patri- a more matriarchal to a more patriarchal. And so some of the goddesses that were earth goddesses, mother goddesses, and were, were undergoing a transformation into something that would fit more in a patriarchal mythology where we have the Olympians with Zeus, the progenitor, and a, and a male figure. Uh, who birthed m- many um, <laughs> many a child uh, from women all around the, the Mediterranean, this prominent theme in Greek mythology. And Athena, uh, who had been uh, more of an Ur goddess, uh, now becomes the absolute uh, epitome of a father's daughter born from Zeus's head. She did not have a mother. 
So there's a huge movement and a huge transformation of, of masculine and feminine in, in this mythology that I think is a part and parcel of the Medusa story. <laughs> you explain that really, really well, Deb. And, and of course, we see it in other Greek myths, like what happened with the Arrhenes or the Furies. They're kind of, if you know that story in the Oresteia, they are, you know, cast down into the depths of the earth. And, and Athena kind of says, we're going to give you an honored place here in Athens, but you're going to have to stay down there. So, you know, I, I think that that this transformation of the mythology, we could see it as uh, evidence of a transformation of cultural values. So we might wonder what's happening in the culture around what we would call the feminine, which is, you know, not the same thing as women, but might be related to it somehow. So the feminine is a psychological principle that has to do with uh, receptivity, with relationship, with uh, that which is lunar and implicit, among other things. And uh, it is contrasted with the psychological principle of the masculine, which is directed and goal-oriented and uh, explicit, among other things. And so how is the culture shifting around these values, and then that gets mirrored in the mythology. Uh, this is such um, a complicated and um, many, many faceted uh, issue. It just the, the history is huge. So I hope we have and believe we have done it justice in a very truncated way. So we could see this as a tension between the masculine and the feminine if we Take a purely Jungian stance and maybe beckon uh, Neumann to join us, then it is a tension between the conscious and the unconscious. That Athena is aligned with Perseus. She is the goddess of wisdom, of thought. She springs from Zeus's mind. So she is associated with egoic awareness and consciousness itself harnessing energies towards the craft of war, but foremost, the giver of law, which controls primitive behavior and in such a way seeks to create a civilization that contains those antisocial impulses. And she is the holder of wisdom, which is that product of self-reflection, that product of insight, and it's part of the age of reason, and this enormous movement in the Greek world to think. Perseus is a half-brother. He's part of that young, heroic world. And the hero, for Neumann, represents the ego that is seeking to separate itself out from the unconscious, from purely reactive instincts. So there's a coupling between Athena and Perseus, and there's also a coupling between Poseidon and Medusa. Poseidon being the god of the oceans, you know, he's, he's associated with the depths of the unconscious, turbulent, unpredictable, unstoppable. And Medusa harkens back to a, a very ancient goddess, fertility goddesses, and this somewhat theriomorphic world of blending of instinct and human with her snake-like hair and, as you'd said, dead perhaps covered in beautiful golden scales associated with birth and death and fertility, instinct, the body and sensuality. So there are these two groupings, and there is this fight this tension that is in the culture and also in each human being to find a way to find the relationship between the ego and the instinct. Athena is such an interesting character, as you'd said, being motherless 
daughter of Zeus. So her relationship to the feminine is really questionable, and she says in some of the myths that she really just likes fellas. She likes the heroes. That's where all of her alignment is. <laughs> that the sibling <laughs> dynamic is dominant for Athena. She is the virgin goddess. So only the sibling dynamic is possible. But one could say that she is uninitiated into many other layers of the feminine power and its less golden aspects. So if we think about this as both a cultural psychic process with the emergence of the age of reason, as well as an individual psyche, you know, the story begins with this virginal archetype of the daughter who is prized by the, the sky god and is the protectress of heroes. And she is uninitiated into the powers of sexuality and a birth and a whole range of thonic potency. And we still are very much influenced by Athena. I mean, every time a father clenches at the thought of his lovely daughter going out on prom night and perhaps losing her virginity, that there is that energy in dads where it's a, it's a real process to be able to let one's daughter go into the world and a wonderful thing when fathers can do it to bless her and to see her transforming from Athena into another kind of feminine potency. But, but it's difficult. So in the world of Athena, she is set aside in a, a temple that is just hers. And her great statue looks down upon the workings of the temple. And she expects through her priests and priestesses that her values alone will dominate. This unconscious dynamism breaks through this golden, law-giving, precise world. Poseidon breaks in to the temple. Medusa, quote-unquote, breaks into the temple, and as much as they enter into this space and are now in the vision, in the sight line of Athena, and a sexual coupling occurs, which is exactly the thing that the Athena archetype is determined not to be in relationship to. This shall not happen, and particularly, it shall not happen in my sight. Because fertility is happening all over the planet. She's well aware that animals breed, human beings are breeding to create children and for pleasure. But Athena does not want to know that. And so the intrusion of this intense sexual and instinctive energy forcing her to behold that process seems to create a storm. So if a psyche is dominated by the Athena archetype, the intrusion of all kinds of intense and violent and erotic impulses would be deeply disturbing. In the collective psyche, just as you were both saying, that there is this great tension between the more ancient instinctive religions that were connected to fertility and the seasons and the earth and intuition versus the growing refined intellectual life of the Greek world there's a tension, and they are trying to break apart. Neumann might say that's an evolution, that the ego has to kind of fight its way out of its instinctive reactions in order to have any sense of responsibility and creativity, the ability to be choiceful. And so when the virgin daughter is forced to encounter the primal sexuality, she becomes enraged. She feels insulted. 
it's not that she even sees Medusa as vulnerable or Poseidon as the perpetrator, that those valences don't seem relevant. What's relevant is that the virginal environment now has to have a relationship with sexuality. And I think the rest of the story unfolds as Athena and the collective psyche is trying to figure out what to do with that loss of innocence, with that transformation. It's interesting that Medusa, as you had said, she doesn't turn people to stone because she looks at them. People are turned to stone if they look at her. And so the curse of Athena is to make her effectively invisible. And that's a phenomenon in the human psyche, that if we are exposed to something that the ego cannot tolerate, it will grow to great lengths to not see it and even create a ring of horror around it inside the psyche so that even if we approach it, the danger of it, the anxiety might stun us backward. And so it's, in a sense, a reaction to something that's very difficult. And at that moment, something again that shall not be seen. So one of the ways I'm hearing this, Joseph, is that Medusa is kind of Athena's shadow. And Shearer, who wrote Athena Image and Energy, really took that perspective. Mm -hmm. so, so we could even think about this culturally, that there are some Athena values that, like you said so well, have to do with thought and, and reason and the life of the mind, and that there are Medusa values that have to do with instinct and perhaps embodiment and uh, sexuality and sensuality. And uh, th there, are some other, there are some other elements about the uh, Medusa, too, that, that maybe she encompasses that we'll get to in a minute. I think that's exactly right on. And that's one of the most important features of this story is that Medusa and Athena are sort of like heads and tails of the same coin. That goes to you know what is psychologically true and is also portrayed in myth after myth after fairy tale after legend, which is the story of the separation, you know, as if Athena and Medusa are separate. They've been split apart, you know, in this in this story at the beginning. It's Athena versus Medusa. But then there's the potential sort of reconciliation. You know, another another aspect of this myth is death and, and rebirth. But of what gets transformed in, in this myth is that in the slaying of Medusa, uh, she then be, becomes, uh, Athena becomes a person who wears on her aegis, her breastplate, the head of Medusa, the image of Medusa, so that what was once destructive is now an aid to to Athena to keep enemies away, to um, be a protector, and and that is a that is a huge uh, shift in a reconciliation and a great example of the unifications unification of the opposites in the psyche. Yeah. That, uh, what do we do with shadow? Well, we raise it up, as you were talking about, Joseph, to the level of ego, and how do we use it? Well, Athena becomes uh, able to use it. And there are still today, um, uh, in Greece, you can buy all kinds of ornaments that have uh, sort of stylized heads of Medusa without the snakes usually, but they have the protruding tongue and and the tusks and the you know the cold big eyes staring, and they are apotropaic, meaning that they ward off danger, they ward off evil. So you know they're like gargoyles. <laughs> they're all over Sicily too. Uh, 
And don't you know, I thought about buying one when I was there. You know, so we have to get past the story of Medusa as this poor, innocent maiden in the temple and into it as a psychological story about what do we do with that primeval uh, kind of energy and how does it get reconciled with with the symbol of mind and, and thought. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think that's in a way the you know the the real happy ending here. Exactly. That I asked myself thinking about the myth over the last few days as we were preparing. Why does Medusa have to be killed? This is a psychological principle, because the ancient world is populated with monstrous things, cyclopses and uh, Scylla and Charybdis and sirens that pull sailors into the ocean. No one's decided that they've all got to go. So what is it about Medusa that is the great problem in this psychic universe? I'm sure there are many possibilities for that. But the one thing which, Deb, you were alluding to, which I think is significant, is that Medusa has no control over her killing capacity. Mm. That once she is returned to this primordial ferocity, anyone that beholds her shall die. Friend, foe, people that love her, people that are dangerous to her, that she has no capacity to decide who will be injured. And so this is also a psychological process that as part of our growth and particularly in analysis, we will come upon and behold primal, instinctive parts of our own psyche. And as is the struggle, part of us would like to yield to them, to behave in primal and animalistic ways. In small doses, that can be refreshing. If that possesses someone and they start behaving in ways that are profoundly animalistic, they will unlikely be committing a great number of crimes because our civilization wants to put guardrails around that instinctive process. So... Medusa is deprived of choices or becomes the symbol of total instinctive potency. And so the next question is what to do about that. Yeah. So we've been talking about this myth mostly on this level of kind of the culture. And, and what does it say about these contents and the relationship between them? Joseph, I think that's that's really interesting. Like, why why does she have to be killed? And I maybe I have a slightly different way of moving into it that answers the question a little bit differently. So this is looking at the myth a little bit more personalistically, if that's a word, sort of like as if it were a fairy tale. So I, I found myself having having this process as I sat with it, um, especially the, the the particular part of the myth that has to do with Perseus. So Medusa is an image of something that's so awful that we cannot face it directly. And that when we look on at it, it petrifies us. It turns us to stone. So that to me could be an image of a psychic complex, in particular a trauma complex. And people who have experienced uh, trauma will often feel petrified or turned to stone by the intrusive memories of the trauma. So part of my early work was with um, veterans of the Vietnam War, and they would have flashbacks or they would hear a helicopter go overhead and feel just stunned into often paralysis. You know, I mean, it really did happen that a car would backfire and they would take cover. So it would like the, the trauma uh, would rear its head again and turn them to stone momentarily. And it was something that they, they couldn't look at directly. It was just too painful. So in the story, we have Perseus, who's the hero. And one of you were talking before, I think it was you, Joseph, kind of saying, you know, a la Neumann, this is an image of the ego, the heroic ego, who's going to take on 
this destructive element that is still full of energy and vitality and lots of other good things too. I mean, Deb, you had spoken before about in some of these images of her, she has wings. So, and she's covered with golden scales. So this is perhaps an image of a trauma complex, but as we all know, embedded in the trauma complex, there is much that is full of healing potential or renewing potential or, or even just a lot of psychic energy. So one of the things that's important is that um, Perseus, as we said before, cannot look at her directly. He has to use this shield in which he, he can see her reflection. So we might imagine from that, that if the ego is going to take on this tremendously uh, dis potentially destructive complex, that one of the key things that is required is reflection. And, uh, you know, we might even wonder about the uh, helmet of invisibility in the winged sandals. For the ego to become invisible in relationship to a complex would say something about the ego's ability to um, kind of stand in relationship to that content without having to sort of focus on the ego state. You know, the ego can sort of go away and just focus on what's going on with this complex over here. And then, of course, the winged sandals would say something about the realm of air, the realm of thought, that there's an ability to navigate through that. And again, it's very sort of Athena-like. But it, reflection is absolutely key here. It is reflection is the thing that allows Perseus to vanquish Medusa. So I don't think we've said this yet, or maybe we did. When he cuts off Medusa's head, two things spring from her neck. One of them is the winged horse Pegasus, and the other is this um, interesting person or giant um, Chrysor, which uh, who is sometimes known as the golden sword. So there's something here about when you, when you manage to integrate, let's say, a tremendously destructive trauma complex, you have access to something like soaring imagination and inspiration. And, and this relates back to the wings that were initially on Medusa herself, and perhaps um, well-mediated aggression. So, and in the, in the myth, Perseus is able to take hold of these things, right? He's a, he takes her head and then he later uses it. He holds up the head and turns his enemies, people that cross him, he turns them into stone simply by holding up her head. And that's how he's able to free Andromeda and therefore unite with the anima, we might say. So it could be a reading of the integration of a trauma complex. And I'll just finish by saying, Joseph, to your question, why does she have to die? You know, in fairy tales a lot, the death of a content signals that it's been integrated into the psyche. And so we might say that uh, the, the tremendous power held in the complex imaged by Medusa is now available to the heroic ego. I'd like to um, go back to the mention of Pegasus and how uh, that is a transmutation or a metamorphosis of uh, the horse from Poseidon, quote, invented the horse. <laughs> and he was the god of the sea, and he is responsible for, for earthquakes and tsunamis, and he had quite a terrible temper. And let's not forget that uh, he is the one who was part of the original mating in the temple of Athena. And so what we see in Pegasus is this beautiful white-winged horse, uh, very magical, that has been transmuted, transformed from something archaic and dark and coming from the depths under the sea uh, into something that has uh, spirit and magic and goodness in it. So there's another transformation. As a subtle um, note to what you just said, Poseidon is often associated with these primal horses that were imagined galloping through these crashing waves. But Athena is attributed with creating the bridle 
and the plow. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And of course, she is uh, the founder, the, the patron of Athens, Greece. And according to legend, uh, Poseidon and Athena both vied to be uh, named as the, the patron of, of Athens. And Poseidon said that he would give the people of, of Athens the horse. And Athena said she would give them the olive tree. They chose Athena. They chose the olive tree. They chose abundance and prosperity and something agrarian over the nomadic uh, horse symbol. But but it's interesting, just, just picking up on what Joseph said a minute ago, that Athena has the bridle, because it says something about there's all this tremendous sort of psychic energy in the image of the horse or in the sort of unmediated depths of the ocean as imaged by Poseidon. But Athena is the growth of, let's say, consciousness that allows that to be harnessed but there's a cost to that too. Absolutely, that there is a, a sublimation of something more ancient, more natural, more organic, and harnessing it to the human imagination. And that is, in a sense, the story of human civilization. I think in our current times, there is a stronger voice for the ancient for the voice of creatures and animals, the voice of the earth, the sky, the oceans, that human consciousness has sought to bridle these forces, but has not, <laughs> but has not been an ideal caretaker of yeah, the forces. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Has been a somewhat irresponsible. So much like the boy who says to Phoebus Apollo, let me, let me give it a shot. Let me just drive your chariot across the sky for a little while. And Apollo kind of gets suckered into saying that, and he can't steer it, and it's singeing the ground, and it's vaulting in the air, and it's creating all kinds of terrible damage. And finally, Zeus has to throw a thunderbolt at this kind of immature ego and say, enough, stop. So there's an an enormous arc that we are still in and undoubtedly will be for thousands of years trying to master the things that we are discovering. And even now with CRISPR technology, being able to AI. move in, uh, change genes, create mm -hmm. uh, eventually approximations of human thinking processes, being the stewards of those things so they bring for the vision of beauty, something better. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking, of course, back to Ian McGilchrist, you know, and the, just the title of his book, The Master and His Emissary, and the emissary has betrayed the master. So in some sense, these images of these horse energies are the sacred thing. And yes, it is important to bridle them, but when does it tip over out of balance to where the thing that's supposed to be in service to these energies uh, kind of becomes arrogant and inflated and takes over. You know, I, I do just want to follow up on this image of the bridal, though, and Athena, because the story continues. Uh, later, there is a hero named Bellerophon who uh, is going to try to conquer the Chimera and he needs to ride upon Pegasus to do this and is told that, you know, he will need to tame Pegasus, which he does with a bridle given to him, a golden bridle actually given to him by Athena. So, so there it is again. There's, there's clearly this is the theme, the relationship, as you said earlier, Joseph, between conscious and unconscious. And that some part of Medusa lives on, that in her primal killing expression, that becomes remarkably repressed, and in cutting off the head, something comes out of her body that is a spiritualized aspect of the primal, but here it has wings and can fly, and can be related to, 
that is something that can collaborate with human consciousness. The last bit I, I just want to say, I know that we could spend so much time on any myth, but once Perseus is finished using the head to finish up a couple of other heroic quests. <laughs> it is too much power for a human to have. You know, it's like Oppenheimer's horror when he looks at the power of the atomic bomb. And he says, you know, I have become the destroyer of worlds. That it's, you know, dangerous for any one human to have the power to just kill anyone he shows this head to. And so at some point it must return to this archetypal realm, which is something that Jung was very concerned about, that we need these powerful, overwhelming archetypal forces to return to this mythic realm where we can see them symbolically, but they're not invading our bodies or prompting us to create terrible things or do terrible things. So... Finally, Perseus gives Medusa's head back to Athena, and as Deb had said, Athena takes it into herself, in a manner of speaking, puts the head on the shield, another on a kind of leather protective front, which also is congruent because Athena is the goddess of war. She's a killer, mm -hmm. or she yeah. prompts heroes to be killers, and so... It's not that Athena is against killing, frankly, but again, it's this war of strategy, war that is in service to some form of civilization. People could argue that that's a terrible effect of human consciousness, but also war has transformed the ancient world and allowed various changes to occur that have ultimately furthered the development of consciousness, one could argue. So the energy of Athena became too isolated, too pure. The instincts come into the temple and cannot be avoided. Athena must see it. She just flips out, doesn't know what to do about it. And then there's a journey where then she reintegrates this ancient, essential power, and Athena and Medusa, in a sense, merge. Well, or like Deb said before, it's about uh, reintegration of that which got split off. Exactly. That's exactly right. So this parallel process. And I very much like the image of Medusa as, as a traumatized individual, because it really gives us an image of the victim who also can be the perpetrator. That t something terrible has happened to her, mm -hmm. but that also has made her mm -hmm. capable of doing very terrible things, yeah. which must be resolved. It's um, a really appreciating how we have wended our way around and through uh, this, this image and some of the mythology. And just want to uh, say again how it is the variation on the Ur myth of separation and transmutation or metamorphosis and reconciliation. Uh, things come apart, things get one sided, things are split apart, uh, and then something else happens so that they are rendered symbolically into something new. And one of the challenges that we know some listeners will have is the literalization of mythology. And, and that's something that we all have a penchant for. It takes an enormous amount of effort to lift out of a narrative, whether it's an ancient myth or it's a personal dream that we had in, in the night, to look at it and resist literalizing it. To say that Medusa is a person deprives us of a much richer use of the metaphor. So hopefully people can support us in offering a very particular lens that in no way diminishes human suffering, but talks about something that happens inside the soul. 
Yeah, and, and and in fact, not only does it not diminish human suffering, it shows that suffering in all of its complexity. You know, one of the things about uh, Medusa as an image of a trauma complex, and of course that's just one way to look at it, but first of all, it shows the tremendous isolation that uh, we feel when we've been traumatized because no one can bear to look at us. You know, when the Vietnam vets came back from Vietnam, they were reviled, they were spat upon, they were called baby killers. And of course, there was great suffering as a result of this, and, and uh, suicide rates were really quite high. And it was because they were carrying our collective shadow. They knew things that we didn't want to know about. And so they, they were kind of like Medusa, in that if we really looked at them and saw what they went through, we would be turned to stone. And as you're saying, Joseph, it also brings up the fact that when we've been deeply hurt and traumatized, we can do terrible things too. And at the same time, the myth lifts up the reality that inside that trauma complex, there is a pegasus. There is a winged horse. Transformation is absolutely possible. So shall we transform ourselves in a very minor way <laughs> and look at a dream? Sure. Let's do and that. before before I share the dream, I just want to remind all of our listeners about Dream School. I know we say this every week. Now you know what's coming. Uh, but Dream School is your chance to become a dream interpreter and to work with dreams the way that you hear us doing so on the podcast and to take this psychological or symbolic frame to dreams, which is certainly hard to do. Uh, but we help you do that. Today's dream comes from a, a, a woman who's 31, who is a full-time mom and a part-time child and adolescent mental health therapist. And here's the dream. I had a dream that I was alone in an unfamiliar building, and I was going to give birth to twins, but they were crocodiles. I was afraid and was trying to escape this building, but there was a midwife there who appeared and who kept finding me when I would try to escape. She would tell me that I had to give birth and she wouldn't let me escape. She was firm, but she wasn't mean. Then it seemed that the building I was in morphed into a hospital and I gave birth to the crocodiles in a hospital room. I was terrified that I was going to have to breastfeed them. This stands out as the scariest part of the dream. At the end of the dream, I was still feeling scared and was holding two baby crocodiles with their mouths open, their teeth exposed, and I was getting ready to breastfeed them. And this is one of those dreams that just makes me just think, God, I love dreams. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and here's the context. Um, I am deconstructing the evangelical Christian faith that I was raised in. This has caused stress on my marriage as my husband is still a Christian. And what were the main feelings in the dream? One, one word, fear. So here are some associations. Midwife. I had a midwife who was very supportive through a miscarriage and then provided all my prenatal care before I gave birth to my daughter. I have positive feelings toward her. For my daughter's birth, I had a different midwife who was not as warm and supportive. She was less experienced and she seemed anxious. My experience with her was negative, and I felt terrified during my daughter's birth. Twins. I am a fraternal twin, and my brother and I used to be very close, but he cut off his relationship with our entire family a few years ago, and we've had a strained relationship since then. He has since tried to go back to our normal relationship, but I still feel very hurt. Breastfeeding. I have had a wonderful journey breastfeeding my daughter, and she still breastfeeds for comfort. She's two. Crocodiles. I can't think of any associations I have with crocodiles. Hospitals. I gave birth to my daughter at the same hospital where I had a DNC due to a miscarriage. It's a place that holds complicated and scary memories for me. After my daughter was born, I experienced heart failure and had to be taken by ambulance to a larger hospital in the next town over, and I was hospitalized there for a week. God, how terrifying. These are the biggest associations that I have with the hospital imagery in my dream. You know, what comes up for me right off the bat is that as you were reading the dream, Lisa, all three of us were smiling 
at this amazing image of giving birth to crocodiles. Yeah, these hungry little baby crocodiles. And, uh, you know, that this is what dreams can do that um, you know, really tickles us in a waking state because it's just so incongruous. And yet our dreamer says that in one word, her feeling during the dream was fear. And I'm thinking there's a connection between our our initial reaction at the the dream story and the dreamer. Mm-hmm. Yes, uh, because there is a lightness in the dream as well as the dreamer's very real experience of of fear. Uh, I almost you know sometimes think the dream maker is saying, "Hey, come on now, you know." Um, Think about this. This is here, here's something really crazy, uh, and I'm wondering if that's you know if that's embedded in the dream to say, can we lighten up a little? Well, dreams are playful. Yes, exactly. E- even when they're frightening, they're 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 offering us an opportunity for play. Yes, exactly. And and she gives birth to you know we we just finished talking about Medusa, so what is it that she gives birth to? But this thonic, this funny word, uh, earthy, pr- primitive, archaic, natural, you know, energy in the raw, as it were. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That here's this image of, and and this is what you have birthed, and you have birthed two of them. Two little baby crocodiles. <laughs> One mythic amplification that we might look at is that uh, in ancient Egypt, there was a crocodile god named Sobek and, and was worshipped over a very long period, along with many other gods in the pantheon. But uh, archaeologists speculate that the root of the word Sobek is to impregnate. So there is something about fertility in the crocodile. He also was the protector of danger. Mm -hmm. Because, of course, it was uh, crocodiles are remarkably aggressive, unlike American alligators that tend to uh, be more avoidant. So this was a constant danger. So he had an apotropaic role that by being a devotee of Sobek and perhaps wearing the amulets and charms, that there was a hope to control his explosive attacks from crocodiles, which was a very real danger. And crocodiles are, you know, where do they live? They live in the river, but they're air-breathing animals. They're, so they're, you know, they're, they're on the threshold. They're on the borderland mm-hmm. between uh, river, water, unconscious, you know, a- and land. They really sort of straddle the realms in their very ancient dinosaur-y kind of way. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and they're, they're, they are very ancient. They haven't changed in millions of years, and or they haven't changed much. They they sort of have stopped evolving. So it could be you know some content of the unconscious that maybe needs a little evolution. Crocodile mothers are also very uh, tender. So one of the things about all reptiles, mm-hmm. um, and definitely crocodiles and alligators are in this category, is there's kind of this real lack of relationship. I mean, if you were to lock eyes with a crocodile, that animal is only evaluating one thing. Lunch. Or maybe two things. Yeah. <laughs> right? I mean, there, it, isn't, it isn't like, you know, you look into your dog's eyes and there's all this emotion and there can be connection and a feeling of, of relationship. You don't have a relationship with a crocodile. You know, you're you're either a danger to it or you're its lunch. You know, it's like that way with snakes too. There's there's a real kind of primitiveness to this, and yet, again, crocodiles uh, certainly one of them, and maybe both are very crocodiles or alligators. I can't remember which one right now. Are very tender mothers who carry their young in their mouth and they uh, roll the eggs, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, so, so they there is a good mother association with these animals as well. So that I mean, they're an image of the the good mother and the terrible mother too. I think it would be interesting to wonder with this dreamer what her relationship with her mother might be like. And of course, that is something that if especially if it's well, I think in any case, but if especially if it's complicated, our relationship with our mother and our internal mother complex 
really comes online when we become mothers and are mothering small children, because there's almost kind of a body memory of how we were mothered. One last association that's just rattling around in my head is that in the Egyptian mythology, when we die, we go down into the hole of Mat, the hole of truth, where Osiris then evaluates us. He judges the living and the dead. Our heart is put on a scale. It must be lighter than the feather of truth. And in that realm, the heart can speak. It starts to rat us out, actually, <laughs> because <laughs> the heart is guileless. So the heart will tell Osiris every little thing you've ever done. And there's a wonderful prayer in the Book of the Dead where Ani is praying to his heart to not betray him or rat him out when the time comes. But there is an evaluation of whether or not the soul will be permitted to move on into this afterlife. If the soul is not found acceptable, it is devoured by Amit, who is a female goddess that is, has a crocodile head and a, a lion's feet and hippo's back legs. And she is the devourer of the dead. The reason I would submit that is in the final line of her associations. She says that after her daughter was born, that she experienced heart failure and had a really scary brush there and was hospitalized and is okay. But undoubtedly that is part of the dream that She's challenged to give birth. That was wonderful on one level for her, but also wound up being somewhat life-threatening. Yeah. So the ambivalence about being put at risk in that way and the trauma around what followed is, I think, also trying to talk with her. And I think that the idea that Ahmet is the one who decides if you will live or die the crocodile of God is making this decision based on if your heart is in the right place, if it is carrying the right story. Yeah, Joseph, I, I like that because this image that we're left with in the dream of she's holding these two little baby crocodiles and they've got their teeth and they're <laughs> waiting to breastfeed. Mm. So that somehow this life urge that came through her through the birth of her daughter is devouring and, and it's true, life devours us. It does. And can we have a right relationship to that reality of being a mother? And our babies devour us. You know, they, they breastfeed and they want what they want at 2.30 in the morning when you're dead tired. And I'm thinking about these, these crocodiles who, crocodiles are aggressive and I'm uh, wondering uh, whether there's uh, you know, some significance to the fact that what she gives birth to in the dream are two little crocodiles. They want what they want, and they have teeth. They are aggressive. And I'm putting that in the context of her disappointment uh, with the second midwife who wasn't as experienced and, and was anxious for the daughter's birth in contrast to the more loved midwife who was very supportive. Uh, so there's a lot here, I think, about mothering. Yeah, I think there's mother uh, stuff. In lots this of mother stuff. And just to pick up on that, you know, Deb, I'm going to take a page out of your book and go back to the setting She's alone in an unfamiliar building and about to give birth to twins. <laughs> what a lonely, desolate sort of image that is first evoked. And she's afraid and she's trying to escape, but then there's this image of this midwife. We might wonder about that. Is that a kind of, is that a mother image? Is that a shadow image? The midwife plays this incredibly important role, though because she doesn't let the dreamer escape her fate. Yes. And of course, escaping your fate in some sense is uh, very, very dangerous. It's dangerous to run away from your fate. And, but you know, if you're pregnant and, and about to give birth, it's, it's not a good idea to run away from that because you could wind up dying. Uh, so, so this midwife is very, you know, sort of like, uh, you know, the psyche, it sort of very gently puts her back on track. No, you have to do this. 
Now, Deb, I'm also going to pick up on on what you were saying before about these two crocodiles. That crocodiles are aggressive. They they really are. I mean, if you've ever watched them hunt, they're lightning fast, and they can they snap their jaws around large animals and then hold them underwater and to kill them. So they're they're a real image of aggression. And I would wonder, does the dream show the birth of this dreamer's conscious relationship with her aggression? You know, perhaps having to do with her change in her religious orientation. And when we first uh, become aware of our aggression, it can feel frightening. It can feel like it might it might harm us. But if we come into right relationship with it, it's a it's very very powerful. And I just want to add one more amplification. It's rumbling around. Is that there was an old myth that pelicans would feed their young by plucking at their chest, their breast so that blood would weep out and their children would feed on that. It became a popular motif, and you can see this show up in many places. It's associated sometimes with Christ, the blood of Christ being the living spirit. But it is also a symbol of sacrifice, that in the Christian myth, Christ sacrifices himself for us, and in the image of the pelican, that the mother sacrifices her own blood for her young. And by extension, we can imagine that those little alligators, once they are latched onto the breast, are going to cause it to bleed symbolically. And so there's a decision, an archetypal decision, about sacrifice for one's offspring. Now, this could be literal, because, you know, we have she has young children, and they still demand a lot. There are only two. That there's so much that needs to be given. But also, she, it may be that she has given birth to some creative potential in her psyche that realistically is going to demand an awful lot from her, is going to require some blood from her. And she has a certain choice about that, as we do with whether or not we're going to pursue our destiny so it seems to, seems to fit in a couple of ways, but I can understand the ego's ambivalence, and it does have a choice in front of it. You've been listening to This Jungian Life. From our website, thisjungianlife.com, you can follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, help us produce future episodes by funding us through Patreon, and submit your dreams for possible interpretation on another episode. We'd like to thank our listener who shared a dream for today's show and hope you'll let us know what topics you'd enjoy hearing more about. Until next time, keep living this Jungian life.